And we're back again. It's the Horror Guys episode. What are we? 253. 253. And we're going to talk about some horror movies, aren't we? Yep. All righty. And who are you? I'm Kevin. I'm Brian. Oh, yeah. You're that horror guy. You're that horror guy. All right. Hey, we're the horror guys. <laughs> we're the horror guys. Wow. Keeping it classy. <laughs> yeah. Forgot to introduce ourselves. All right. Well, we got a big... Big week this week because we messed up last week. <laughs> so you get extra stuff this week. Well, you do in the newsletter anyway. Yeah. Podcast will be about the same length as always. Yeah. What do we got? Oh, we got When Evil Lurks, a new movie. I like that new one. Argentinian, Argentina film. And The Nun 2, another eh. new one. Eh. Hostel, an older one. Oh, yeah. Incident in a Ghost Land. Mm-hmm. Yeah, pretty okay. new. Yeah, and those are the ones we're going to talk about today. We're going to have a short film in there, too. If you're on the bonus newsletter at HorrorBulletin.com, which is free, once a week email, you're also going to read about It's Alive from 1974. Killer, Killer Baby. Baby. Killer Baby. Which was supposed to be in last week's episode. Somebody forgot to include it. Somebody. Somebody. I'm uh -huh. not going to say who. Yeah. <laughs> it's also go The newsletter also is going to have Cold Prey from 2006. What happens when a bunch of people go to a ski resort somewhere in the Netherlands? Ski resort <laughs> abandoned and closed, and bad things happen. Yeah, they do. And the Bad Seed, a classic child murderer story from 1956. No, nobody killed the child. It's the child is the murderer. <laughs> well, that's a twist. Might have been the first time it was <laughs> done. I don't know. It's considered a classic. It is. It's been remade about 13 times. Uh huh. And there's a stage version, too. Of you course can, You can is. see it on stage. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and people do that. <laughs> yeah, they do. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And uh, just a reminder that the Horror Guy's Guide to the Films of Amicus Productions is available now. Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Barnes & Noble, Kobo, Scribd, Apple, and everywhere else you get books. And... Somebody's working on a Karloff book. The Horror Guy's Guide to the Horror Films of Boris Karloff should be due out within the next week or two. Depending on how fast Horror Guy Kevin gets his second proofing done on it. It's off at the editor now. <laughs> yes. Hey, hello, Ed. <laughs> hello. <laughs> <laughs> and that should be out in a week or so. I think it's probably the best one of the bunch so far. I like it. As they go on, they get longer and more in-depth and more detailed. Mm -hmm. I need to go back and redo those first ones again. <laughs> oh, more viewing. More, more, more movies. But we got a good couple of movies for us this week. We got some new ones. We got When Evil Lurks from 2023, written and directed by Damien Rugna, stars Ezequiel Rodriguez, Louis Zimbrowski, Damien Salomon, and Federico Liss. Hour and 39 minutes. Yes, it's subtitled, but it's worth it. It's totally worth it. Spoiler free, no spoilers here. Once Upon a Time in Argentina. They ran into a little bit of trouble in a town and the rural area surrounding it. That's, That's an understatement. An understatement <laughs> yes. And this is a very strange and gory movie. It's very well made. It's dark and creepy. And it's gross in all the right places and all the good ways. I think we both thought it was great. Yes. And it's almost like a, a alternate reality. Was you know, the more I think about it, it's like, you know, because they all kind of accept this as real. And this is a thing that happens sometimes. Argentina, I don't know, superstitions and happen, stuff down you know, there. Well, but they keep saying, oh, you know, it can't happen here. It might happen in the city, you know. But, you know, the, the way they made a couple references to, like, this is, like, and, and the way the exorcist character had um, all that really intricate equipment. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I think it's kind of like, almost like a parallel reality. But it's very well done. Yeah. yeah, sometime in December, we'll come up with our top 10 list for the year. But I'm pretty sure this is going to be on it somewhere. Yep, I think so. Well, what happens? Don't spoil it to death for us, but give us a little hint where we're going. Well, Pedro and his brother Jimmy here shooting out in the forest. They don't think it's a, a poacher because there's too many shots. They're not hunting. It's a revolver. You can tell by the sound. Well, as the sun comes up and the credits roll, the two go out to look around their land and the surrounding area. The dogs lead them to a man who's been torn in half. They find his lower half. It could be a puma. Mm, no, it's it wasn't not a, puma. a puma. No, and they also find parts of some kind of machine that's all bashed up. Well, they're on Ruiz's land now, so they go tell to him about the body. But 
Ruiz doesn't like them. I get the feeling he's a landlord or something. Yeah, yeah. Well, he's he's a big time farmer, and they're they're poor, poor people. So, instead, while well, they go to see Maria Elena Gomez, where the dead man was heading, and the old woman says they were waiting for the man to come and kill Uriel, their son. What? What? Well, Pedro and Jimmy go inside to see Uriel. He is a diseased, rotten, bloated mess, but he's not dead. The old woman said prayers didn't help. The other boy says they had reported Uriel's condition a year ago. You can smell this guy right through the TV. Oh, yeah, he's in bad condition. Yeah. Well, the two men go to the police who think that uh, he's drunk. Pedro wants to call the mayor. Well, the cleaner, that was the guy that... uh, got torn in half apparently that the sheriff called he was the on their way you know he, the, the sheriff knew about it he called the cleaner but it like took him a year to get around to it yeah well the cleaner is essentially an exorcist so it's kind of a matter of possession but the police still laugh at the whole thing well they try going to see ruiz next and he has no problem believing them ruiz says all four of his dogs ran off last month since the rotten makes animals crazy And they all talk about this going viral. They don't want that to happen. Well, that night, Ruiz goes to the old woman's house with his his gun and sees Uriel for himself. You don't kill Eva like that. It'll only get worse, she begs. And it's made clear numerous times in the movies that if you shoot it with a gun, that's the worst thing you can do. Yeah, that makes everything worse. I guess knives and axes and stuff are probably okay, but guns are no-no. Well, Uriel wants to be shot and begs for it. He even threatens Rua's unborn child. Well, in the morning, he's still there. Rua's wife brings Pedro and Jimmy to see what happened, and Rua's admits that he couldn't do it. And he knows that it will only make it worse, so the three men decide to carry the guy away. And they all know that's a really bad idea. But Everybody do says, anyway. don't do it, don't do it, don't, don't do it. Don't move the body, but they do it anyway. And that is just gross because he is wet. And <laughs> He's leaking. And yeah, yeah. Well, all the three drag him outside all the way to Ruiz's truck. They drive hundreds of kilometers away. And then they get to the spot where they're going to dump him. They go and look in the back and he's gone. We should probably stop there. Where did he go? Yeah, where did he go? Is that the end of the story? He didn't look like no, he was in the condition to walk off. the beginning of the story. Yeah, and things just go downhill from there. Yeah, this one is just all kinds of messed up. Yes, it is. It's not exactly a zombie movie, but it kind of plays out like one. It's more of a crazy demon virus thing. Mm-hmm. It's a weird situation with a demon possession system that we hadn't seen before, but it all seems realistic and feels like it may have come from some kind of real legend somewhere. Feels like there's a backstory here. It's very good, weird and unusual, but excellent. Yes, one of the best. I've read some reviews online where people say this such and such scene came out of nowhere. And no, these scenes didn't really come out of nowhere. Some of these scenes were telegraphed pretty good. Yeah, some of them you can see coming. But but then when the obvious thing happens, it's a lot more intense than you expect. Shocking. Yeah, it's still shocking. (laughs) Oh, some of the stuff. They're not going to. They're not going to. They're not going to. Oh, they they did. Whoa, they did. Yeah. Okay, and the, um, then the one that they should, shouldn't have is The Nun 2 from 2023. Yeah. Directed by Michael Chavez, written by Ian Goldberg, Richard Nang, and Akila Cooper. Stars Tessa Farmiga, Jonas Blockett, Storm Reed, and Anna Popplewell. Hour and 50 minutes. It's a good one-hour movie dressed, dressed, <laughs> stretched into two hours. It is milked out, yeah. There is a trailer in the show notes. Without spoiling it. What happens? Well, the two surviving main characters are back, and as the title hints, the demon nun is also back. She's not as obliterated as they thought from the first movie. It's very consistent with the look and the feel of the first one. And, you know, the cast and the effects are all good. It's, you know, just one of those that, you know, is good. It's more of the same. It's fine. Yeah, basically that. If, If you liked or disliked the first one, you'll probably like or dislike this one. Yeah. I think it's very consistent. And, uh, yeah, all around the same feel and everything, but more more adventures of them and the nun. Yeah, we we yeah. Uh, reviewed this, I want to say episode two or episode three. It was very early when we got started, We when we watched the first, back in 2018. Mm-hmm. And it was all right. I remember I liked the sets and the scenery. Yeah. The nun character was kind of cool, but the story was kind of blah. It was yeah. okay. 
yeah. And now here's number two, and it, it, it's, it's also it's the same thing. Okay, yeah. We'll, we'll give them a taste without yeah. spoiling it completely. In 1956 France, a boy helps a priest with services and then does various things. There's a dark closet in the basement, and there's something evil inside. The boy gets the priest, and they investigate. When the holy water starts boiling, they know there's trouble. That's usually a bad sign, I think. Yeah. I'm no expert, but, you know, <laughs> if the holy water starts to boil. <laughs> things, then you make tea. Oh, yeah. It's the holy tea. <laughs> right. Things go very badly for the priest after that as the nun arrives and credits roll. Elsewhere, Sister Irene deals with day-to-day garbage issues at the convent. Sister Deborah refuses to do a confession. There's nothing there to confess. They all live in a convent after all. Well, there's a story going around about a demon who lived under an abbey and looked like one of them. The Vatican then sent in a pair of demon hunters who used an ancient relic to defeat the demon. Sister Irene sits in the back listening and quieting, knowing that she was there in that first film. Yeah, and this is kind of darkly humorous. They're all, they're all sitting around peeling potatoes in the kitchen. And this wise old nun, she's telling it like it's a, a campfire like ghost, a ghost story. story yeah. and, and it's close, but it's not exact. And, and Sister Irene is just kind of off in the background, not looking, but thinking, mm-hmm, yeah, uh-huh, yeah, yeah. yeah, that was me <laughs> she's talking about. <laughs> well, we cut to Sophie, who's talking to Maurice, the caretaker of the school. He was known as Frenchie in the first film. A girl delivers food to the school and runs into the nun who kills her. Sister Irene dreams of Maurice, who turns into a fanged monster before she wakes up. The next day, she's visited by a bishop, who tells her about a bunch of weird stuff that's been going on in a moving pattern. They think the demon is continuing its rampage, and Father Burke from the previous film has died of cholera. And so she's the only one left that knows what's going on. And she's reluctant, but he's pretty insistent, like she's the only one with the experience with this, you know, so... <laughs> And then Sister Deborah hops on the train to assist her friend, but she doubts her own faith, so she may not be that useful. Road trip. Back at school, Maurice fixes a cabinet for Kate, a teacher that he's sweet on. Sophie is being bullied by the three mean girls in school, and they take her to an abandoned area of the school and play Defy the Devil, something they made up to scare her when they lock her inside the room. Except there really may be something strange in there with her. And she gets out when Maurice opens the door for her. Ah, but do they really get away from it? You're going to have to watch it and find out. And was there really something in that room? You'll have to watch it. I think the the nun may be the patron saint saint of loud jump scares. Yeah, they were heavy on it with this one. There's not a lot of atmosphere in this. It's all (laughs) jump scares. People appear and disappear into thin air just like they were a Batman. And not just the weird possessed ones either. Mm -hmm. Everybody does it. Suddenly, yeah. (laughs) The church knows about a powerful holy holy relic buried under a school somewhere. They know all the details. They know all about it, but have never bothered to send anyone to find it. Right? Ever? No, not... Why would they do that? Not until Sister Irene asks about it. Well, we heard about this thing, and there's all these pages in the book, and it says it's right here buried in a hole in this school, but let's just leave it there. that's how you find it, yeah. 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 (laughs) Bull. (laughs) As with the first film, the sets and locations are very nicely done. Valak and the other bad things are realistic looking, and it's all very creepy. Also, like the first film, there's really not much of an explanation for much of what goes on. It's just weirdness for the sake of weirdness. If you liked the first film, this is more of the same. If you didn't, then this is... More uh, of the same. More of the same. Yeah, Yeah. it is. Good or bad, it is. (laughs) Of all the movies this year, this is one of them. It is. It's a movie. (laughs) (laughs) And then we got a short film called The Last Halloween. And this one's from way back in 2014. 2014. No telling what comes up in my YouTube feed. This was directed and written by Mark Russell and Mark Thibault. Is that how you say that? Thibodeau? Thibodeau. 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 Stars Ron Bash, Emily Atal... Uh, Ron Bash! I'm just, I'm just Emily Alatalo and Angela Bizgara. The names are escaping me today. Well, yeah. Thibodeau, you yeah. gotta you got to channel the, your inner Cajun. Runtime is nine hours, nine hours, nine minutes and 43 seconds. The long short. <laughs> and this is available on YouTube to watch for free. It's trick-or-treat time once again. And the little ghost ghost boy gets a can of cat food at an old woman's house. And she's clearly creeped out. 
She, yeah. yeah, she's it's she, a weird house. Yeah, she only opens. She's she's got the the chain still on the door, and she kind of reaches through and hands them cat food. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you need to do that one of these days. Get the kids outside cat food. Mm, well, there's more to it than that. Well, then the four kids move on to the next place, where a creepy old man gives the devil boy a dead bird. Well, that's weirder than the cat food. Yeah, it is. Well, the next place looks like a prepper's military compound, and he tells them to leave. There's a woman named Kate inside who comes down the stairs. She looks sick. He tells her that they can't just open the door for just anyone anymore. They could be infected. What is going on here? What is? Yeah. Was, was it, that Julian Richings? It was. Spoiler. It was. Yeah, he's got a role in this. I don't think he was even in the credits, but it, it, well, you check IMDb. Yeah, he hits him. He's there. Yeah. It starts out main, mundane enough, but it gets weird quickly as we see that this is not a normal place and a normal Halloween. Uh, it's really well writ, uh, lit and well shot, has good music, and it's not clear until the end what's really going on. And we're still not completely sure, but bad things. Bad, bad things, things happen. Happening, yeah. yeah. It was very cool. Yeah. Incident in a Ghostland from 2018. I keep seeing this mentioned online, Mm -hmm. and I keep thinking we did that. No. No, that was uh, Prisoner of a Ghostland with Nick Cage. Yes. And I skipped this movie movie for the longest time, thinking we'd already seen it. (laughs) This one is written and directed by Pascal Logier, stars Crystal Reed, Mylene Farmer, and Anastasia Phillips, hour and 31 minutes. What happens? What happened to our spoiler-free judgment zone? I don't know. You didn't write one. (laughs) (laughs) Blame it on me. (laughs) Well, we're not going to spoil this one either completely. Despite the age, this is one that should not be spoiled. I'm making making that decision. Okay. But we'll give you a little taste. Um, Our judgment on it? We liked it. I really liked it. Yeah. It wasn't what I expected. you got to be paying attention. It's a little confusing at times. You have to pay attention to it. Yeah. Well, Beth reads some H.P. Lovecraft to others in the car. Except, no, it's not. It's her writing. It just compares to Lovecraft. And her younger sister, Vera, is not supportive. Why do you waste your time writing that crap? This is Mom and two girls. And they are passed by an insane-looking ice cream truck. We saw the ice cream truck driving up behind them. I'm like, be eating you. Yeah. You know, from Jeepers Creepers. Uh-huh. It's the same kind of vibe. It's got that same vibe, yeah. Only and this it is a turns out ice cream I was truck. right. Yeah, okay. not, not too far off. Yeah. Well, they stop at a shop. Beth tells the shopkeeper that her mother has inherited a local house from her aunt. And she watches the weird ice cream truck drive past the store. She reads the newspaper about the family killer, who has now offed five families in the area. Well, Beth, Vera, and their mother, Pauline, get to the house, turn on the electricity. It's kind of an old, smelly, old lady's house. Lots of dolls. Actually, some cool decor, antiques and things. I would have purged the place almost immediately. <laughs> I would have kept a lot of that stuff. The dolls had to go, yeah. The girls soon get an ugly doll jump scare. One is, hooked, one is rigged up like a... a amusement park uh, funhouse doll that springs out of the in wall. In a closet behind a mirror and you got there's like a secret door you open the door and this and thing jumps spring out. loaded. Who does that? <laughs> yeah. Vera whines about how Beth is afraid of everything. Vera is convinced that Pauline loves Beth more and none of them notice the ice cream truck parked out on the street. Well, a big bald man attacks Pauline out in the hallway since they all left the front door open. And uh, yeah, they all walked inside, went right upstairs, just leave the door standing wide open. Yeah. The big guy sniffs them both and then drags away Vera. Pauline attacks the strange woman and tells Beth to run away before the big guy comes back. Pauline then stabs the big guy about a hundred times. And then it jumps to years later. Beth is having nightmares about it. And she's married with a son now, doing great as a horror writer. And uh, she gets a call from home saying, her sister, that she needs her to come back. And I'm going to leave off there. So, return to the incident at Ghostland. Yeah. She goes back. Uh Uh-huh, she goes back home. All right, well, this one's kind of all over the place. Starts out as a stalker slash home invasion story, then progresses into weird, boring, somewhat boring family drama. Then it goes into kind of a possession thing. Then it goes back full circle to the home invasion thing again. With a side order of kidnapping and brainwashing. 
He's got it all. <laughs> it is. There's lots and lots of loud jump scares in this, so beware of that. It's a very surreal, atmospheric, and weird game of reality versus what's worse than reality. Very cool. It's one of those mind bender <clears throat> movies. Really well made. I thought I thought the script was really clever. And that takes us to Hostel, two thousand and five. Eli Roth's work. Yeah, written and directed by him. Stars Jay Hernandez, Jerry, Derek Richardson, and Athor Gudjensen. Hour and 34 minutes. Spoiler free, what happens? The situation is realistic, except for the idea that so many people could keep that thing a secret. Hmm. It's a big project and a big operation, and they keep it a complete secret. So, I mean, there's a lot of people in on it. So that's a lot of people that have to keep their mouths shut. And yeah, all the bad people are in on it everywhere. Oh, yeah. Well, the acting and direction are very good. The effects are brutal and visceral. If you don't mind a lot of blood and pain in your horror movies, this one's for you. If you don't mind a lot of blood (laughs) and pain. It's a torture movie. It's a torture movie. Yeah, there's a lot of that. Three friends, Paxton, Josh, and Ollie, leave a hotel in Amsterdam. They talk about museums, but they really just came to Europe to get high. They soon find out how easy that is. There's a fight at the club, and the three are soon thrown out. They go to a brothel next, and Josh is pretty uncomfortable with that, but he makes do. They do have a lot of fun, but they return to the hostel after curfew, and they can't get inside. Help, let us in. Well, they can't get in, so they stop at Alex's place, and he says he knows where to get the best girls. He has photos that he uses like a catalog. He has the best girls and some stories to go with them. The Slovak girls in that place go crazy for Americans, and he tells them exactly where to find the place. They are sold. The story is irresistible, and they all plan to go there. Well, they get on a train and talk to a Dutch businessman who knows the place that they're going. You can do anything to the girls there, he says. He's pretty creepy. The strange man then eats a meaty salad with his fingers, and it makes makes a whole big thing out of being a hands-on meat eater. (laughs) Finger, finger, finger. (laughs) Well, they get off the train in a fairly desolate area in Slovakia and take a cab to town. It's a very scenic place, and the three make their way to the hostel, which is huge and nice. It's even got a spa, which the guys visit immediately. They meet Natalia and Svetlana in there, and that leads to dancing, drinking, and many hijinks around town. Morning arrives, and Ali is nowhere to be found. John and Paxton check on him at the desk, but Ollie checked out earlier this morning. Ollie doesn't answer his cell. Kana, another visitor there, runs up with a photo of her friend and Ollie. They seem to have run off together. Paxton doesn't believe it. No, it seems fishy. But Bunch what are they going to do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Can't, he won't answer his phone. Yeah, and neither does her friend. Yeah. So. A bunch of kids jump out and demand bubblegum. These are a bunch of weird kids. The bubblegum gang. Mm-hmm. While two guys spot Ali on the street and follow him into the torture museum, it turns out it wasn't Ali. It was just someone wearing what looked like Ali's jacket. We then cut to Ali's head sitting on a table as a man in a real torture chamber whistles as he goes into a room with a screaming girl and cuts her toe off. Was that Kana's friend? I think it was. Yeah, it was. Mm -hmm. Josh Paxton and the two girls go out partying, but Josh starts feeling sick and goes back to the hostel to sleep. Whatever it is takes longer to kick in for Paxton, and he ends up passing out too, but in a locked storage room at the club. Yeah, he's trying to find the bathroom, goes in the wrong room by mistake. Luckily, gets locked in. We cut to Josh, who's now cuffed to a chair with something over his head so he can only see out of one eye. He sees a, uh, quote, surgeon come in wearing scrubs and a mask. The man pulls off the hood, and Josh gets a real look at where he is. He is handcuffed to a chair, and the surgeon has a drill. Bzzz. The surgeon uses the drill on Josh. We see that it's the salad-eating businessman from the train. I always wanted to be a surgeon. He toys with Josh, telling him he can go, but he doesn't mean it. When Josh offers him money, the man says, No, I am the one paying them. It what? goes poorly for him. Yeah. Yeah. Paxton wakes up in the morning, <clears throat> he's locked in his little room somewhere by accident, yeah. and goes back to the hostel, and the clerk says he checked out this morning. Paxton says it must be a mistake. His room has two girls in it who invite him to the spa, 
almost exactly word for word what happened the previous day with an Italian Svetlana. It's like they have a script that they're following yeah. for these new people, and they don't recognize him. Because they weren't there yesterday. It's a, 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 a round two. Mm-hmm. Well, the bubblegum kids eventually steal Paxton's phone. That was convenient. Yes. Paxton tracks down the two girls that he knows, but they say that Josh is with Ollie now. Well, that's true enough. <laughs> yeah, it is, technically. The girls true. say that the missing guys went to an art show, and Paxton insists on going there to meet them. They drive to what appears to be a very old factory. There are a bunch of cars in the lot, and the drivers all seem to know one another. The man at the door says admission is free for Paxton. Hmm. Hmm. Natalia leads Paxton inside, and we hear the surgeon whistling as he dissects what's left of Josh. Paxton soon sees everything, but he's grabbed from behind and dragged away. Wait, this isn't an art show? It kind of is. Well, yeah. As he's dragged down the hallway, we see all manner of torture going on inside those rooms. Looks like a busy place. Yeah, it does. Paxton is changed to a chair as guards verify that he's an American. A German man, who seems very nervous, comes in as he pulls out a great big pair of scissors. Paxton talks German to the guy, so the man puts a gag in his mouth to shut him up. That's when the guy starts up a chainsaw. Uh Uh-oh. Yeah. Paxton vomits in terror, and the man cuts off a few of Paxton's fingers. The man then slips in the puke and cuts his own leg off with a chainsaw. He's not very good at this. No, he isn't. Paxton then slips out of the handcuffs because half his hand is missing, and he gets loose in time to shoot the man before he can call for help. That was convenient. It was. Paxton then shoots the guard and unlocks the rest of his cuffs. He opens another room and hides in a cart under a dead body. Someone grabs the cart and wheels it into an elevator. The man then takes the bodies to a uh, chop shop where they cut up all the pieces for disposal. No waste. You... Paxton knocks the man out and gets back into the elevator. He winds up in a dressing room where he steals clean clothes and gloves to hide his missing fingers. He finds a business card, Elite Hunting, with some pretty high prices written on the back. An American tourist comes in and wants to know what it's like. Paxton says it was good. The man has paid a small fortune to kill someone, but he's not quite sure how it all works. And he's very excited about it. Yeah, he is. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Paxton leaves this place and goes outside where all the drivers are. He hears a woman screaming inside and then goes back inside. It's the American who is blowtorching Canna's eye out. Paxton shoots the guy, but Canna's eye hangs by a thread. He helps her, uh, I guess it's helping, by cutting it off with scissors. I guess. Cut your dangling eyeball off. Well, she does stop screaming and, you know, she's better after that. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, okay. it doesn't look like the best solution but maybe it is and of course it yeah. oozes orange pus and a big gusher when he snips it off yeah it's gross got your eye yeah it, though, anyway now the two of them work their way back outside they steal a car and drive off on the road he sees Svetlana and Natalia and Alex talking together on the street and he runs over all of them that was satisfying then all the little bubblegum kids surround the car and he buys their help with a bag of candy to slow down the pursuers. They are vicious little bastards. Um, the kids, I mean. Mm-hmm. They know how to use rocks. The, there's so many of them. But, yeah. yeah. The police yeah. have a checkpoint on the road, and they don't look friendly. Paxton and Canna run off by foot to the train station, where Canna sees her face in the mirror and then jumps in front of a train on purpose. She wasn't that bad. No. It could have been fixed. It could have been. Yeah. Paxton uses the distraction to hop aboard a train going the other way. Paxton then overhears the Dutch businessman, the one who killed Josh, a few seats behind him, giving the same speech with the meat-eating business that Mm -hmm. he made to his friends on the way into town. When this man gets off, Paxton follows him into the restroom and locks the door. Paxton then cuts off two of the man's fingers, almost drowns him in the toilet, and then cuts his throat. He then gets on another train before anyone finds the body. So he gets away. The end. Yeah, the end. Happily ever after, I guess. Well, yeah, until the next movie. Yeah. What happens then? Well, we'll we'll find out in a week or two. Yeah. All the travel stuff in the beginning does seem very realistic and believable. Actually, that hostel looks like a pretty nice place to be. Really nice. It's all well shot and looks really good. All the acting is flawless from all the characters. 
Kevin pointed out that the only thing in the film that isn't believable is that so many people could keep this a secret. There's so many in on it. And that American business guy, I mean, he was just such a dink. And you know so, he's going to tell everybody. So over the top. He's not going to keep his mouth shut. <laughs> I mean, you know, he didn't look like the kind that would. Walks into a room at work and's like, hey, anybody kill anybody this week over the weekend? Yeah, I had, uh, this guy did. I had an awesome time in <laughs> Europe. <laughs> All the bad guys dress identically so they're easy to spot. It's like, let's get you some cartoon character uniforms. <laughs> There's lots of gore and torture here, although some of it is just off screen. Still, if you're into this kind of film, it is a good one. It was really well made, yeah. yeah. Eli, Eli Roth does good work. Yeah. Yeah. And here's a hand. We watched the second and the third one, too, but we'll save those for another time. Yeah, we'll talk about them another time. Over on the newsletter, horrorbulletin.com, where you can sign up for free to get six or seven sometimes mm-hmm. <laughs> reviews in your email. We also, we did all those with spoilers, so you can read all that stuff. And also, It's Alive from 1974. A thoroughly creepy, well-done family film that, that was, holds up even today. That was very good. Yeah, I was impressed by how good that still is. The, yeah, they give birth to a baby who's like a killer mutant kind of thing. Mm-hmm. There's a remake that was not so good, but we, they, yeah, never mind. We should, Actually, the remake, we speak of that. We, yeah. the remake is discussed in our Amicus book. Oh, yeah. okay, there you go. Then we also talked about Cold Prey. Which follows a familiar formula, you know, a bunch of people isolated in the in the country, but it's well made. Yeah, it was a little formulaic, but well made. Yeah. If you, you can kind of know from the beginning who did it, mm-hmm. but that's not really all that important in this one. No, it's a, it's a neat setting of Norway or Sweden or somewhere. You remember Norway? Norway, Norway okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, they all talk funny. Yeah, they do. <laughs> <laughs> and 1956's The Bad Seed, a sinister classic that's beautifully made. It's also kind of a dated, stretched-out slog, we thought. Because it is two hours and nine minutes long, and it feels it. It's a lot longer than it needed to be. Yeah, I thought yeah. so. Yeah. It's love it or hate it at the same time situation. Mm-hmm. It's all right. Yeah, it's all right. You should yeah. see it. Classic. May, you may not love it, but you should see it. You should see it, yeah. All right, well, that's it for this week. Next week, we will have four more movies in a short for you, or six more movies in a short if you're on the newsletter. What kind of things? Um, you, um, yeah, you got something creepy crawlies? You, what's that crawling on your hand there? Is that an ant? Oh, my goodness. It's an ant. It's going to be ant week, isn't it? Well, somewhere on the website <laughs> from 1950-something, we already did them. Much lo- It's probably the most famous ant film of all time. We've mm-hmm. already done that one. Science fiction horror with giant ants. Next week, we've got six other killer ant movies. Did you know they had made so many? We didn't. There's a lot more than the There's ones we've more, watched. Too. More than the ones we've yeah, seen. We could, we could probably yeah. do two or three of these weeks at some point. Yeah, actually, there are. A lot of insects are scary. Yeah, <laughs> we were doing the Animal Week the other day, a couple of weeks back, and we're like, watch the Empire of the Ants, and we're like, you know, there's a lot of these. We could just do a whole week of that. We could. And, and we now have. we did. We will. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, tune in next week or stop in at horrorguys.com and check out our horror ant collect we have an ant farm yeah, this we week. have an ant farm <laughs> all right well that's it for this time i'm brian and i'm kevin we'll see you next week see ya <laughs>